Hey, Chris here from Mom Academy, here to help you, yes you, make your game dev dreams become a reality. Today is part 18 of the AI series where we're going to talk about burst spawning enemies. This is a really cool way to add kind of a more dynamic feel into your game. So whenever a player is running around, what we're going to do is have a particular area, we'll show it on the map. So whenever we enter that area, we will start spawning a configurable number of enemies and configurable enemy types. We can, of course, add many of these throughout the level, and the way we're setting it up, we can each area can spawn different enemies and different numbers of enemies at a different rate. Then what we can do is actually extend this so we can do some other kinds of triggers other than just area-based. We can do something like a time-based trigger so we can configure maybe so far into the round it will spawn more enemies and at a different time, it'll spawn more of a different kind of enemy, that kind of a thing. And before we go any further, I just want to give a huge shout out to everyone who's supporting me on Patreon right now. I really appreciate it. Every bit helps the channel grow, reach more people, add value to more people, and that means that more people are making their game development dream become a reality. If you want to help me in that cause, you can show your support on Patreon, patreon.com slash academy. You can get your name up on the screen, you can get a voice shout out, and some other cool perks. In this tutorial, we're going to use the sample scene. And the first thing I'll do is make a square underneath this arch, and we'll make it whenever the player enters this arch, we'll burst spawn some enemies. Once I cut up the floor, I'll select the top faces and color it red, so that way we can see where that spawn section is going to be. Then I'll create a new Pro Builder cube and set it to be a trigger. Then I'll size it so it's the same size as this red floor that we just put together. I'll rename the cube to be called Burst Spawn Trigger. And then we'll create a new script called Enemy Burst Spawn Area. Before we do anything, let's take a look at the enemy spawner script that we first did in AI Series Part 4. And this is probably a good time to mention that if you've not watched AI Series Part 4, where I talk about how to dynamically spawn and place enemies on a nav mesh, that's where we implemented the enemy spawner in the first place. I'd highly recommend you go back and check that out if you've not seen that one yet. In here, we made a private void do spawn enemy that accepted a spawn index. Since this does all the heavy lifting of actually spawning an enemy based on the enemies we have configured on this enemy spawner, what we can do is just make this a public void, which allows us to call it from other classes. But there's a couple caveats I want to call out here with doing it this way. The most important one is if you do it this way, you must have every single enemy that you want to spawn by a burst spawn area tied into this class. So any spawnable enemy needs to be attached to this class because we're going to reuse that enemy list in the enemy burst spawn area class to find out which one we should spawn because this do spawn enemy accepts a spawn index not an enemy scriptable object. We could refactor this and we'd also have to handle the object pool creation in case we've not already created that object pool for a particular spawnable enemy. So to keep this tutorial kind of on point, that's how we're going to do it here. And speaking of the object pools, you may recall that in the enemy spawner on awake, what we do is create object pools for every enemy scriptable object that we have on this class based on the number of enemies to spawn. So if we configure our first spawn area to spawn more than the number of enemies to spawn that we define here, we may end up in a situation where we don't have any more objects in our object pool. So we'll make a small enhancement to our object pools in this video to make it so the object pool will automatically expand if you try to get a new object and there are no more available objects. If we open up the object pool, the first thing we'll do is add a private game object parent to the top. And we will assign the pool.parent, which is this that we just defined, to be the new game object called prefab.pool. We used to just create all the objects underneath this parent, but now since we're trying to dynamically resize our object pools, we need a reference to that parent so all of our newly created objects will also be a child of that game object. So we can safely remove passing in that parent to the pool.create objects because the pool already knows what the parent is. So we'll remove that from pool create objects and also from the private void create objects that accepted the parent. What I'm going to do is cut out the code that we do in this loop and move it down to a new private void create object since we want the same code to execute every time that we're going to create an object and we're not only going to create them from this create objects function now. We'll also do it if we have no available objects in our pool. It's much nicer to be able to just call this one function to create them instead of having to copy paste this code and then manage it in two places. I'll also rename the parent.transform to be the capital P parent transform, which is the class member variable parent that we're putting all of our objects under. 
Then we'll scroll down a little bit to where we do public poolable object get object. And in here, we'll check if the available object pool dot count is zero, meaning we have no available objects. In there, we'll create a new object. And remember that as part of creating a new object, the poolable object adds itself back into this available object pool. So we can safely execute the rest of this function without worrying that we won't have any objects in the pool. We'll open up the enemy burst spawn area class and add in some private serialized fields, the enemy spawner, because we want to reuse some of the enemy spawning logic that we used in this class. We'll also keep a private list of enemy scriptable object called enemies, and this will be the list of enemies that will spawn in this burst spawn area. This way for each different enemy burst spawn area, we can configure different enemy types that will spawn whenever the player enters that area. We'll also have an enemy spawner dot spawn method called spawn method. That way we can again choose the ratio of each enemy where it can be completely random or we can use a round robin spawning method. We'll also include a private int spawn count. Set that to 10 by default. That'll be how many enemies to spawn whenever the player enters this area. We'll also add a private float spawn delay and set that to be 0.5 by default. That'll be the delay between spawning each one of these enemies. So with these defaults we will spawn over the course of 5 seconds 10 enemies. And the last variable that we'll set up here is a private coroutine spawn enemies coroutine. That way we can make sure that we only trigger this trigger one time. We'll then implement the magic unity function private void on trigger enter, which accepts a collider other as an argument. And what we'll do is check if the spawn enemies coroutine is a null. And if it is, then we will start a coroutine called spawn enemies and assign the return value of that to spawn enemies coroutine. Now let's implement the spawn enemies coroutine. That's private I enumerator spawn enemies. We'll define a wait for seconds wait to be a new wait for seconds with the spawn delay. And then we'll do a simple for loop for int i equals zero, i less than spawn count, incrementing i by one each time. And inside here, we'll check if the spawn method is round robin, then we'll do enemy spawner dot do spawn enemy, enemy spawner dot enemies dot find index. And we'll put in a delegate function here, enemy fat arrow, enemy dot equals. And we'll look at our enemies list that we've defined in this class and find the index of i modulus enemies dot count. Long time viewers of this tutorial series will recognize this code from the enemy spawner where we did the exact same thing to get the spawn index of an enemy using round robin spawning. We do the spawned enemies modulus enemies dot count which will cycle through all of the available enemies up to the number that we have and then it will restart from the beginning. And if the spawn method is random then we'll do enemy spawner dot do spawn enemy passing in the enemy spawner dot enemies dot find index doing another delegate function with the enemy fat arrow doing enemy dot equals enemies indexed by random range zero to enemies count. And actually this won't work as we anticipate it working because the way find index works is it invokes this delegate function for every enemy in that enemies list, meaning we will get a new random range every time that we're checking if this enemy is equal. So we're actually gonna come back and move that random range count up out of here. So above this, we'll do int index equals random range zero to enemies dot count. Instead of doing that random range inside the indexer of this class enemies, we'll pass in the index. That way we've only calculated the random index one time and then we pass that same index into this delegate function. Then we yield return wait and at the end of this coroutine what we want to do is destroy this game object. Since we've already done all the burst spawning that we want to do there's no point for this game object existing anymore. So we can safely destroy it. You can also just disable it. It, it doesn't make much of a difference really. If we hop back to the unity editor we'll select the burst spawn trigger and we'll change the layer to be from default to enemy attack radius because remember that the enemy attack radius collides with the player and nothing else. So that's a perfect layer for our burst spawn triggers to be on. We'll then attach the enemy burst spawn area script to this object. We'll drag the enemy spawner reference to the enemy spawner field and I'll select two enemies that we can spawn. Let's use the tall enemy and the homing ranged enemy. We'll use the random spawn method, leave the spawn count as 10 and the spawn delay is 0.5. I'll drag the scene view so we can watch whenever they spawn and I'll make sure that my enemy spawner will only spawn one enemy. If I then click play, we see only one enemy spawns, the normal enemy. I'll kill that enemy really fast, and then I'll step into the spawn trigger. And we'll see across the level, several tall enemies and some homing ranged enemies also spawn all across the level. So that's pretty cool. But what if we wanted to spawn only within the bounds of our burst spawn area? To make it spawn only within the bounds of a burst spawn area, what we need to do is first modify the enemy spawner to accept a spawn position on do spawn enemy. So we'll update that method signature to say it accepts an int spawn index and a vector three spawn position. A little bit below in here, 
we sample position based on the nav mesh triangulation and that's not what we want to do in all cases so we'll cut out that piece where we take the int vertex index equals random range zero to triangulation vertices link we'll move that up into the spawn round robin enemy and the spawn random enemy functions We'll do that by actually creating a new method and we'll call that choose random position on nav mesh. And in there, we'll just cut this line about the vertex index and also the triangulation vertices indexed by vertex index and paste that in here where we return the triangulation dot vertices indexed by vertex index because that returns in world space coordinates of vector three, right? And then whenever we call do spawn enemy from spawn round robin enemy or from spawn random enemy, we'll just pass in the second argument to be whatever the return value of choose random position on nav mesh is. And we'll replace the navmesh.sample position, the first argument to be the spawn position that's passed in. So we'll still sample a position just around wherever the user passes something in. And we'll update this error message that's trying to use a triangulation still, and we'll pass in the spawn position there. So that way we know from this error message that, hey, wherever we called this from, we're passing in some invalid parameters. And that should be it. Now this will spawn at, well, it'll try to spawn in any arbitrary position that we pass in, and it'll log an error if it can't spawn for any reason. Next step, we'll open up the enemy burst spawn area. At the top, we'll put a require component type of collider because this is a trigger, so it needs to have a collider anyway. Before, we just didn't need to reference it, but now we do. And we'll also create a private bounds and call it bounds. On awake, we will get a reference to that collider by doing collider, collider equals get component type of collider. And then we'll assign our bounds to be the collider.bounds. This will give us the most generic representation of where inside of this collider can we spawn something. If we have a really weird shaped mesh that we're using as a collider that's not easily encased by a cube, then we may try to spawn something a little bit out of this area. Because of how bounds works, it kind of is a bounding box around our object. You can see some of these examples here that in some cases, if you're not careful, you can get a, a not good result with this code. But this is also kind of the most simple code to get this working in most cases where you're going to be using a box or a cylinder or a, something like that. And then we'll scroll down to the spawn enemies coroutine. And wherever we're calling do spawn enemy, it's complaining because we don't pass in that second argument, the position. So what we'll do is pass in a new vector three where we pick a random range between bounds.min.x and bounds.max.x. So that's anywhere from the smallest x to the largest x value that we have here. We're going to put it at bounds.min.y. So the assumption here is that you place this object on top of the nav mesh directly or within two units of the top of the nav mesh. If you're going to structure it differently, then you need to reconsider what value you put in here for this y. And for the z, we'll do the same thing we did for x, random.range between bounds.min.z and bounds.max.z. So we're picking us within a 2D rectangle on top of the nav mesh within the bounds of this collider. And since I need to use this exact same code just below here, I'm gonna extract it to a function. So if we ever wanna change it, we can change it in one place and affect both spawn methods at the same time. So we'll make a private vector three, get random position in bounds. We'll make it return a new vector three, exactly what we just put. And I just cut and pasted here. And then for the second argument of do spawn enemy, we'll just call get random position in bounds and it'll give us a random position in the bounds. Then if I hop back to the Unity editor and click play, and then I walk into this area, we'll see all of these enemies spawn within this cube that is the red box. So that's more of a feel that you kind of expect with a burst spawn within an area is generally those enemies spawn in that area, right? But I can't leave you here. There's one more scenario that I think would be really cool. And that would be if you enter in one area, you want the enemies to spawn in another area. That's really cool on dungeon crawlers. If you enter in some place, you'll have them spawn in some large area or some small area that's a little bit off screen and they just come at you out of nowhere. So how can we do that? We'll open up the enemy burst spawn area again and at the top we'll add another private serialized field the collider and we'll call it spawn collider. On awake we'll check if that spawn collider is null. If it is then we'll assign it to the git component collider so this collider so that way it'll work the exact same as it just did if we don't assign a collider there. But if we assign a collider then we can have it spawn within the bounds of that collider. We'll hop back to the unity editor and I'll create a new cube and put it over here in this little mazy section and just have them spawn in one section of this. I'll again set it to trigger and since I'm not going to do any kind of on trigger enter or anything like that, I'm going to leave the layer alone. It doesn't really matter what layer it's on. I'll rename it to be called spawn area and set it as a child of the burst spawn trigger and I'll drag this collider to be the reference of spawn collider. If I then click play and I walk into this red area again, we'll see those enemies start spawning over there instead of on top of me. That's perfect. So now we've gone through spawning anywhere on the level randomly 
spawning within this area and spawning within a target other area. I hope you got a lot of value out of today's video and you understand how to implement burst spawning whenever a player enters in some trigger. But I'm going to challenge you on your own, take what we did today and implement that on a time-based trigger instead of an area-based trigger. If you have been getting value out of this video or this series, please consider liking and subscribing to help the channel grow, reach more people, and add value to more people. This new video is posted every Tuesday and sometimes on other days too. If you have any questions, if you have a suggestion for a topic, or if you're implementing AI into your game, drop a comment down below and I'll see you on the next video.